works. Madam Chair, we are live. Okay. Ready to go at one o'clock. Okay. So you, Madam Chair, we're ready. Okay. Welcome everyone. I'm uh, Councillor Janice Maynard and I will be chairing uh, this afternoon's Committee of the Whole meeting. Uh, we appreciate your uh, patience and cooperation as we navigate this time of uncertainty. And thank you for taking the time to join us electronically. Today's agenda lists all the items before committee for consideration. The recommended motions on today's agenda are shown in boldface and copies of the agenda have been posted on our website. This meeting is being live streamed and any participation in the meeting proceedings will become part of the public record. The recording from the meeting will be published on the county's website immediately and can be viewed by sec selecting the live stream meetings on the button right of the county's homepage at the county.ca. Under agenda item five, I will be asking for comments from the audience. And today we have one, members of the public who wish to provide comments at future meetings can do so by contacting clerks to register by noon of the day prior to the meeting. Your name will be included in the council minutes and form part of the public record posted to the county's website. Any motion made at this meeting is not final until the council meeting of February 23rd, 2021, at which time council may approve, amend, defer, or otherwise change the motion made by this committee. And I would ask that everyone please turn off or mute your cell phones. Thank you. Um, we read 1.1, due to COVID, this meeting will be conducted as a virtual electronic meeting with no physical public attendance. And we've already given the directions for uh, providing comments. And I'll ask for a motion to confirm the agenda, please. Councillor Roberts, seconded by Councillor Bailey. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is a Roberts Bailey motion that the agenda for the Committee of the Whole meeting of February 11, 2021 be confirmed. All in favor? That carries. So uh, any disclosure of pecuniary interests or the general nature thereof? Seeing none, with no deputations. Item number five is our comment from the audience. And today we have uh, Sarah Doran from the, uh, the executive director of the Picton BIA regarding item 6.2. Hello. Hello, Sarah. I'll just ask, I'm sure that if you have YouTube to, uh, to, uh, to turn it off and to remind you that the comment from the audience that you have three minutes. Okay, thank you very much. Whenever you're ready. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah Doran and I am the Executive Director of the Picton Business Improvement Association. And I'm here to speak on behalf of the BIA Board of Management regarding the following items the draft patio bylaw, the draft littering bylaw, and the staff review of the mobile canteens, food trucks, and other refreshment vehicles bylaw. Um, I would like to begin by comment or commending staff on the tourism management plan. This document is incredibly thorough, transparent, and accessible. And it's clear that a great deal of work went into this document and that stakeholder consultation was a high priority. I plan to address the tourism management plan in greater detail at a future council meeting. And for now, I will focus on the three bylaws on today's agenda. Uh, first is the draft patio bylaw. Last summer, our members benefited from an extended patio season and no associated fees. As we anticipate another busy summer this year, coupled with lost revenue due to COVID, the BIA Board of Management is pleased to see the continuation of this advantageous program. The BIA Board of Management is also in support of the proposed changes to the littering bylaw, as historically there has been an issue with the disposal of household waste in municipal bins on Main Street, causing unsightly overflows in the heart of downtown Picton. 
We also hope that the new receptacles installed last October, which contain compartments for recyclable items, will also lessen the impact of litter on Main Street this summer season. Though we do hope that the municipality will continue to increase the number of bins on Main Street in the peak months, as they have done in the past. Finally, the mobile canteens, food trucks, and other refreshment vehicles bylaw. The Board of Management understands that this bylaw has not been updated in quite some time and that staff intend to consult with stakeholders before presenting an updated draft. We would like to be included in consultations for any changes pertaining to the Town of Picton so that we can represent our members. We've received some very passionate feedback from our members on this topic and understand that changes to this bylaw could have long-term implications for our restaurant owners. We also recommend including the other BIAs representing the downtown areas of Bloomfield, Wellington, and Consecon. Again, many thanks to the staff for their thoughtful work on some very complex issues. We appreciate the opportunity to represent our members' interests and look forward to collaborating in preparation for this year's influx of visitors. Thanks a lot. Thank you. I'll ask if there is uh, anyone on committee that has a question for Sarah. Seeing none, thank you, Sarah, for taking the time. Um, I think oh, Councillor St. Jean did. Question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <clears throat> thank you, Madam sorry. Chair. Um, they, thank you, Sarah, for uh, coming forward and uh, voicing the concerns of the business community, particularly in Pecton. Um, as uh, you and I spoke before the meeting, uh, it is my intention, and I'm going to tell Council now that, uh, that I ask uh, when we re get into item 6.2, that uh, the part four of the motion also in include and be more specific who the consult, uh, who will be consulted, that those being uh, uh, the Picton BIA, the Wellington Business Association, Bloomfield Business Association, and Consecon Associations, just to clarify who staff will be consulting with, because uh, uh, as, as you no doubt understand, and, uh, and I completely agree that these are, our bricks and mortar businesses are the ones that could be most affected by any uh, major changes to this bylaw. So consul consulting with them, I think is extremely important. And once again, thank you, Sarah, for uh, your due diligence and representation of the business community in, in Picton. Councillor Harper, I see your hand. Uh, no, Madam Chair, I was just making sure you didn't miss uh, Councillor St. Jean okay. there. Yeah. Okay, that's everyone then. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Madam Chair. So we will uh, move on to uh, nope. item do you, Madam Six. Chair, a motion to receive? Oh, sorry. Yeah, a motion to receive the uh, comments from the audience. Councillor McMahon, Councillor McNaughton. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is a McMahon McNaughton motion that Council receive the comments from the audience. Thank you. All in favor? No. Carries. Okay, um, 6.1. Would someone like to put this motion on the floor for discussion? Councillor Nyman, Councillor Margitson. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's a Nyman Margitson motion that Council receive report HJM 01 2021 status update on the HJ McFarland. Memorial Home Redevelopment Project for information. Okay, is there any uh, questions or comments from committee? Councillor Nyman, is that your hand, Councillor St. Jean? Yes? No? Councillor Nyman? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I guess Kyle's there. So I I'm just wondering, um, have, have we, uh, has there been any discussion about the site uh, and, and where it's going to be? Because my fear is that it's going to be behind the Wellings, which was uh, brought up when the Wellings were, was um, starting their, their process. And 
the concerns of that time was the home should not be put at the back. So is there any discussion about the site where it's going to be? Through the chair to uh, Kyle. Kyle, are you on the line? I can see your, can you put your video on and answer this question or I'm happy to help? Yes, hello. Uh, through his worship, the mayor to uh, Councillor Nyman, um, we've had some preliminary discussions about um, potential locations. There hasn't been a concrete or definitive decision on the actual location. Um, that's going to involve uh, discussion with planning, um, uh, the planning development uh, department, as well as uh, some of our um, consultations with the public and, and uh, uh, the rest of the community at large. Anything further, Councillor Nyman? Uh, no, I, I guess for me anyways, uh, I'd like to have that consideration that um, it don't go behind the building of the Wellings. Because if I remember correctly, there's another building for the Wellings also that's gonna be there. And as I said before, the concern was that the building was going to be put behind so we can kind of uh, keep in mind of, of having it out in the front. Any other members of Councillor Council? Councillor Roberts? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Kyle, it's good to, to sort of see you and hear from you. Um, Kyle, I have two questions. They both relate to the, the family council. But before I ask the questions, I, I just wanted to commend you and, the, uh, and your staff for what is clearly uh, the selfless commitment at the H.J. McFarland home. Um, you know, I think we're all very grateful that, uh, you know, we've been spared an outbreak at the home. And it's obvious that you and your team have been incredibly diligent with regard to infection control and other measures. So big congratulations, Kyle, and please pass that along to your staff. Will do. Kyle, uh, my first question concerning the family council is that uh, it, you've, you've hired a project manager to come up with the terms of reference uh, for the project and the service requirements. And I. I believe you're also working on a communications uh, plan as well. And I'm wondering uh, how the project team will involve the family council as they develop uh, this you know, critical, import, um, critical project for the community. You know, from, from my perspective anyway, the families are major stakeholders. They're not just a stakeholder, they're a major stakeholder. And uh, I think they could be very helpful with regard to uh, functional requirements for for the future. So just wanting to know how you're going to go about including the family council there. Okay. Um, through his worship, the mayor to uh, Councillor Roberts. So um, there is extensive consultation that's going to happen at multiple phases through the project. Um, we recognize that the family residents and staff are critical to the development of uh, a home that's going to be a home of choice. So we'll involve them at every level. Um, there'll be planning meetings, there'll be consultation. Um, we'll, we'll have ongoing communication with them. Um, we've already started to socialize where we're at, at the home level as part of our internal stakeholder communications. So the staff have been apprised of where we are with the project management component of it and hiring a project manager. Um, who actually in, 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 in fact has, uh, has already begun. He started on Monday. So when I initially wrote the report, um, we were in that negotiation phase, but I'm pleased to say that uh, we have a project manager on board um, and, they, and, and he started on Monday. So we're, we're extremely pleased with that. Um, but uh, between, between family council, the residents, um, residents council and, uh, and the, the staff, compliment we're going to have lots of communication they'll be very actively involved in that process thank you kyle madam chair should i ask my yes. second question okay. yes thank you. go ahead go ahead kyle, this, roberts thank you um kyle the, the second question i have is is maybe just jogging my memory 
I seem to recall that back in the summer of 2019, there was a commitment um, on behalf of the executive director at the home to uh, provide quarterly reports to council with regard to the circumstances, progress, you know, just general information. And, um, and in the context of providing that report to council, it was also going to be shared with the, with the family council. So I'm wondering if that has gotten lost because of COVID and other priorities, or what is the plan in terms of the interface between uh, yourself as the ED uh, council and, and the family council? Again, through your worship mayor to uh, Councillor Roberts, um, we discussed that topic actually at the family council meeting on Monday. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously transparency is very important. Um, communication is also an important uh, aspect of understanding and, and knowing what's going on at the home. We, we understand and recognize that there is a, a need to communicate the activities that are happening here at the home. Um, our discussion revolved around the template. Um, unfortunately, I was not aware that there was a, a commitment until Monday. Um, since that meeting on Monday, um, I've obtained the, the initial template um, that uh, I guess there had been one or two reports sent to Council that kind of discussed some of the key factors. Um, but my communication with Family Council on Monday actually revolved around the need. So there is a legislated requirement to communicate certain aspects of the operation with Council or a board, as well as Family Council. So. Um, I'll, I'll look at what the template contains and then I'll look at what the legislation requires and then I'll, I'll put together a package and share that um, with, uh, with a family council and then make sure that it's going to contain the information that uh, the councillors um, are going to be uh, looking for. Thanks, Kyle. That's great. And please keep up the good job. All right. Well, thank you very much. Yes. A, a comment from, uh, from CAO Wallace. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. I would just uh, uh, add that uh, there are a few places in our organization where there's um, a statutory obligation to share particular information with council. And we typically do that outside of council meetings through other uh, means, whether it's water, wastewater information or the like. So I, I think the conversation Kyle and I are having is what's the um, the right level of information to come at what frequency. We try to use the CAO quarterly report to provide operational updates as to what's going on. Uh, but I agree that there's probably uh, an appetite for the community, especially as we move into the build to get um, more information. So without crowding the agenda, I'm not sure we're gonna be able to commit to quarterly um, going forward, but we will find a way to see more of Kyle representing the home in front of council. Thank you. Anything further from committee? Well, just, oh, yeah, Councillor Margitson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, a question to uh, Kyle or Madam CAO. It's regarding, if you could just update me on the overview. I, I understand from the report that our, our funding scenario um, the model and the construction subsidy comes in at about 38 million. And I also, I, from when I read it, I understood that we need to adjust by 2025, our current building because of standards. And if this isn't correct, or you can, and then I wanted to know, I saw an estimate for the total project. So can you tell me why or when we're committed to the project? And is, is the funding, we have to make up the remainder of the funding, uh, regardless of what it costs. Just, I'm trying to get an overview of the process and the monies involved and how there, if there's any conditions to it or, or wh when it's binding because of regulatory requirements and, and et cetera. If you could provide that overview, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. So through, through his mayor to Councillor Margitson, um, there is a commitment, uh, well, there is a requirement, a legislative requirement that we redevelop and that uh, we are in the new home by 2025. 
Um, so that is that is a legislative requirement. Um, it has to do with the age of the building and the the uh, the space allotment for the residents, um, and the class of home that we are considered. So that uh, that one is is uh, you know a a, um, a hard date we have to have. The um, the total project cost. I mean, there's lots of variables in there, and it it there is. Obviously, construction materials costs are going to to um, have to be considered into that. COVID has has created um, certainly a challenge um, and an increase in some of the product, building products and whatnot. Um, so there is going to then most likely be an increase. Um, looking at the Eastern Ontario Wardens Caucus uh, report, um, and then looking at our estimations for a home our size of 102,000 um, square feet, which is the approximate um, size that was initially put in when we put in for the, um, the uh, request for an allocation of 76 beds with the ministry. Um, the, the early estimation for a home that size came in at about $56 million. That equates to about a $550 per square foot cost. Um, when you look at the Eastern Ontario Wardens Caucus uh, report, they're estimating on average about $423 per square foot. So there is some maneuvering in there. Again, lots of variables depending on the types of things that we're asking for, um, you know, and how can we cut those costs. As we go through the redevelopment phase, there's going to be a number of consultations um, to determine what the costing is going to look like. Um, and that's going to be something that the project manager um, council will be heavily involved in. Um, and then there'll also be a cost consultant that will, will uh, um, price out those various aspects of that and then give us an opportunity to adjust our, our, our wants with our needs, um, which will then be reflected in the cost of the, the build. Thank you, Kyle, for that. And I'm no presuming the estimating doesn't include the fitting of the building, like you said in your report. So there's a, num a numbers that still have to be exposed as far as what our commitment is going to be. But I thank you for that overview. No problem. And uh, Mr. Mayor uh, to Councillor Margotson. So part of the work that we're doing right now that we've already initiated is our asset management. And we're actually doing an assessment of the uh, equipment that is in their existing building and determining what their uh, uh, current life is and whether or not we can move certain components of our home to the new home to help reduce our costs. Thank you very much. No problem. Thank you. Um, Councillor Harper. Actually, that was my question finance with, uh, from Ernie, so I'm good. Thank you. Okay, anyone further? I'll just make a, <clears throat> a brief comment. It's been a uh, Quite a few, uh, quite a number of years now that we've been uh, contemplating this uh, this rebuild, and um, I'll just say to Councillor Nyman's point, um, I think the intention had been to uh, that that uh, that building would go at the uh, at the front of the property since it's the you know nicely landscaped and uh, so I'm just saying historically that was uh, what was content what was contemplated. Take that into. Okay, so the motion is on the floor. Nothing further. Um, everyone in favor? All in favor? That carries. Okay, we'll move on to uh, item uh, 6.2, sidewalks, littering, and uh, refreshment vehicle licensing. If I could have someone put that on the floor for discussion, please. Councillor Harper, Councillor St. Jean. St. Jean motion. The council received report CSP-05-2021 for information. The council directs staff to bring an updated bylaw to regulate uh, outdoor patios to the, to the February 23rd meeting of council for approval. Three, the council direct staff to bring a new bylaw relating to littering to the February 23rd meeting of council for approval. And number four, the council direct staff to review and update Bylaw 1776-2020, mobile canteens, food trucks, and other refreshment vehicles with consultation from the Community Economic Development Commission. 
the PEC Chamber of Commerce, the public operators and industry and report to council no later than April 15, 2021 with its findings and proposed amendments to the bylaw. Okay, if I can ask anyone that wants to speak to this in the first round to hold their hand up uh, while I make a, while I make a list. I only have Councillor McMahon, anyone further? St. Jean, Lyman, Harper, Forrester. Get everybody for a time. Okay, Councillor McMahon. All right, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, okay, Director Davis. Um, I'm going to concentrate initially on the uh, littering bylaw, and I understand that the focus of this bylaw is the debris that's dumped at the side of the road and on properties and that type of thing. I'm just wondering, though, last year during the tourist season, we suffered greatly with the amount of litter and garbage in the in the streets, I guess you would call them the tourist areas. And I wonder, um, do we have a formula for the placement of garbage receptacles? That type of thing. I'm, not, I'm not talking so much about the Disneyland thing where a garbage can every 30 feet or something like that. But um, the complaint was always that they were over full. So people just threw the garbage to the side of the road. And if anyone has ever been to Disneyland or Disney World, the first thing you do is realize you just don't throw garbage around um, because it's so damn clean. So it's there. I mean, we have the parks, the beaches, the sidewalks. And I noticed your response to uh, Councillor Margotson's question earlier today uh, with regard to receptacles on um, the patios. Is there any way of bringing other vendors that are selling ice cream or coffee or whatever to help out with how we keep the garbage off the streets? That's my initial question. Okay, uh, through the chair back to Councillor McMahon. I mean, I don't think we have a, a, a scientific um, uh, or even a, a substantial policy or protocol as to how we deal or manage refuse. I would, I would suggest that uh, uh, we have acknowledged in previous years uh, uh, when summer high season arrives, we put out more receptacles or we have as practice put out more receptacles. Um, last year, I think, as, as was highlighted by um, um, Sarah Dorian from the Picton BIA, uh, we, we included new trash receptacles in October on Picton Main Street in particular, uh, that I, as far as I, as, as if memory serves correct, and I would assume that that will help to uh, assuage some of the problems. Part of the request that we've made uh, through the patio bylaw is to include more trash, tra trash receptacles uh, on the patios. And certainly it's, it's something that we've acknowledged in the tourism management plan uh, and the report that we brought to you that we have uh, uh, a need for higher or, or more trash uh, receptacles. A lot of that will probably uh, will come forward uh, in some of our public park places and in around uh, the Wellington issues uh, when we bring that uh, reports uh, back around Wellington Beach um, uh, in early March. So I guess to answer your question, Councillor McMahon, uh, we do not have a scientific formula that tells us where and when we should put uh, trash receptacles, uh, but we have acknowledged the need for more of them. Uh, operationally, we're making arrangements to have more, I believe, in the in 2021 season. and. Part of the way we are hoping to solve this problem is in partnership or this challenge is uh, in, through encouragement of businesses that have uh, um, high generating uh, uh, trash uh, businesses on the main streets to have more trash, uh, to have more receptacles, including uh, the sidewalk patios. Okay, thank you. Anything further, Councillor McMahon? Um, maybe later, thank you. Okay, Councillor St. Jean. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. A um, couple of comments more than anything, and maybe there's a question in there when I get there. Uh, with regards to the uh, uh, sidewalk patio bylaw, 
Um, again, super supportive of this. Uh, uh, all of the business owners that took advantage of it last year, I believe are going to again, and they, uh, uh, they, they're really encouraged to see the support from the municipality uh, with regards to dealing with all the COVID matters that, and not being able to be 100% open. Uh, with regards to the, the additional, uh, the addition of garbage refuse containers on the patios, um, I'm not sure how easy that's going to be given the size of them. Uh, we're not talking 50 by 20 foot patios, we're talking basically one parking space. Uh, so very limited space. And one of the concerns that I've received from, from uh, a number of members uh, that, that did have patios was that uh, may, maybe there was a misunderstanding of how the protocol is for the cleaning between customers. Uh, each time somebody sits down at a patio table and when they go to leave, their garbage is taken care of by the business owners already uh, as part of the cleaning protocols. Where the concern arises is when, if they are forced to put a garbage can on their patio, then the general public will start using it. And that's maybe putting an undue additional cost onto those business owners. Uh, not to mention the fact that having a garbage can sitting beside your dinner table may not be the most appealing thing to anybody. So uh, I guess my question from all that is, uh, is that something, Todd, that you feel is man uh, something that we can work around or should we just simply do away with that part of it? And, and maybe the municipality should, should enhance its uh, garbage receptacle placements in certain areas. Uh, through the chair to Councillor St. Jean, I mean, I, th I think what we're, I mean, the motivation behind uh, uh, trash receptacles or refuse receptacles in the close proximity to sidewalk patios was that's an area where we have license, we've uh, have a program. I mean, I appreciate the fact that uh, that there are businesses uh, may there may be some some minor burden on a business to manage some trash receptacles, but I also think that it's a bit of a give and take. I mean, we've we've acknowledged the fact that COVID is challenging to, to those businesses, but we also waived fees for those businesses and including rental fees of parking spaces so that they could have patio expansion in 2020. Uh, we're in, uh, advocating for that again in 2021. Um, and, I, and, I, and I feel like as part of a good partnership uh, our ask in return is that they uh, provide some extra garbage receptacles to help take some of the burden off us. Uh, we uh, we uh, we were asked by them to take burden uh, off of them with uh, how onerous our patio, not, not that our patio policy or, or program was particularly onerous, but there was a financial requirement that we've, we're advocating to waive for two straight years. Um, and so I feel like as a good partner, uh, we're asking in return for something minor that's going to help uh, manage the entire issue. Um, but I mean, certainly it's up to council's decision as to how they want to see that proceed. Um, and certainly it's your right to remove it from the bylaw if you so desire. Thank you. Um, I will save my second question because I know you have a, a, a list ahead of you, Councillor Maynard. Okay. Um, Councillor Nyman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, Todd touched on it a little bit, so I guess it's a good time to ask. Um, so with the, the patio, uh, sidewalk patios, and I'm all for them, but not at the expense of, of parking spaces. So uh, everybody knows and I, uh, the problem we have with parking, and it's been a problem, and it's going to be a problem going forward. And we're losing two, one to two parking spots for some of these patios. <laughs> but the, what I see is other businesses have patios that don't take the parking spots. So we know it can be done without taking parking spots. So I don't know how we do that, but I'd like to see that removed that um, they can have the patio by removing the parking spots 
Now we we know that there's, you know, it, it's we're made up of a large group of seniors who, you know, there's no parking spots on Main Street. They have to park in behind. Not only seniors, but a lot of people, and <laughs> we're putting them. Uh, out a bit, I guess, by having them park away from where they need to go. So I don't know how we go about taking that out of there. That I'm all for patios, everybody is, but not at the expense of parking spaces. So I'm not sure how you want to answer that, Todd. I'm happy to answer it uh, through the chair back to Councillor Nyman. I mean, my recommendation for this year is to include uh, the ability for businesses to expand. I think we are we are uh, heading into a season in 2021 that is not going to be much different than 2020 in terms of congr uh, limit on congregation size and the ability for people to gather indoors and or um, on patio with uh, physical distancing requirements. So, I mean, your point is well taken. I, I mean, certainly it's council's decision as to how they want to proceed with this bylaw. If they want to remove uh, the ability to include space around a parking space uh, starting in 2021, that is, uh, you know, your right to do so. However, I would, my recommendation is such that we extend this program for the this season and then give a full review of the program when we we feel like um i mean i i'm feeling confident that 2022 is going to be a season that uh, we are beyond covid and and we would have the ability to make some substantial changes to that program that maybe acknowledge the need for parking i'm just uh, my only concern that I would bring up to you is that uh, uh, businesses are going to be really strapped in terms of space for this year, uh, inside and outside with physical distancing requirements. I don't think we're going to be beyond COVID in the 2021 season. And so, um, and that's why I recommend we move forward in this fashion for this year as a, we, we brought this forward last year as a temporary matter or a temporary opportunity for, for businesses I'm suggesting we continue that for uh, in acknowledging that COVID is part of our lives for 2021. 20, um, so, I mean, uh, I, I also appreciate the need for parking and I have, understand that it puts people out when they have to walk a greater distance or have a harder, uh, more difficulty finding parking. Uh, I would suggest that that's a matter to be addressed in a full review of that program uh, that we, we, have in, we intended to do this winter uh, because I had uh, a hope that we would be beyond COVID. Uh, obviously, that is not the case, and it does not look like that that's going to be the case for this upcoming season. Thank you. Anything further, Councillor Nyman? No, that, that's okay. good. I, um, I see what the okay. saying, but I Councillor uh, Harper. No. Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, thanks, Todd. Good job. Just a couple of thoughts on the Wellington Beach <laughs> and the, the food truck issue. Just. Um, one thing I just wanted to clarify, you just talked about um, in the report, it says uh, equally important to manage people coming and going from the property. I just wanted to clarify what you mean there is, i.e. we're not allowing in and out privileges. So nobody's leaving. So whatever we have in there is to is to satisfy with them for the things they might have wanted to leave for. Is that how I'm to interpret that? Well, I mean, I think what I tried to say in the report is regardless of who the user group is going to be in 2021 and beyond, whether it's a residence only beach, it's a mix of visitors and residents or, or what have you, uh, I think we all have to acknowledge the fact that there's going to be some restrictions when you uh, about people uh, being able to come and go. I'm not saying that they have to come and they can't leave, but the reality is, is if we're going to fence off areas to to uh, make it uh, specific for a user group, that makes it less appealing for people to come and go from that property. And so my suggestion was that if it's going to be more difficult or more restrictive uh, a space, then we need to be more considerate about the amenities that we offer there. People may not be, I mean, they may be free to come and go. I'm not saying that they will or they won't. That We haven't got that find a point on what we're going to bring back to you in March around the Wellington Beach uh, proposal. However, uh, I readily, I want to readily acknowledge that whatever restriction we put in place is going to either demotivate people from leaving that property. And if we don't have amenities available to them on site, um, uh, or I, I feel like it's, we need to be compelled to provide further amenities is all. Okay. Yeah. I was going to say, I, I, I thought I read somewhere in your 
in your original report, no in and out privileges. And I would I would support that. I think that those of us who were hanging around there on Saturday would would tell you that that was an enormous problem was with people coming and going. Um, and uh, well, also people waiting to get in. So it, it was a bit of a logistical nightmare on that. And the reason that they're leaving is if you want to know if you're thinking about what you would put down there, a lot of it I think relates to hydration, like water and ice. Um, and um, so just a couple of thought starters for you. No, and I uh, threw the chair back to Councilor Harper. I appreciate that. I, I suspect that that's it certainly was part of our original report. I just, I'm not sure we're exactly sure exactly what that model looks like at this stage. We're still working through some uh, of the feedback from Council and how we might sort of incorporate that. But I also agree that, you know, if we can provide amenities on site for people, that means that they don't have to leave the property. It helps with the logistical nightmare of trying to get people in and out as well. Um, Councillor Forrester. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my question relates more to, to the, the fine for littering. Uh, I see Mike Kelly's there. Mike, could you tell me over the last two or three years, how many fines are we handing out on average a year for littering? We have, do we have those numbers by any chance? No, we don't. Not very many that I'm aware of. Well, to me, this is one of the biggest problems here and how we find a way to uh, actually make people think twice about this. You know, $300 fine for, for littering on uh, municipal property. I'm sure some of you councillors have taken a road drive down Airport Road. I do it probably every week. One of these days, I'm going to catch one of the buggers who does it. But there'll be couches, 10, 15 bags of garbage. Last spring... I did a quarter mile just outside the provincial park and I had five or six bags of garbage. This is in areas where there's no houses. So it's not blown out of uh, litter boxes. This is stuff that people are throwing out of cars. So first off, I'd like to see the fines a little bit higher, but what is the plan to actually catch some of these people? Because I have seen people come out of the provincial park, right out of the main entrance, start to speed up, the window roll down and out comes a bag of uh, McDonald's stuff, which is surprising. I guess they've taken to the beach too, them. But we need to have a plan to sort of curb this sort of uh, activity. Um, through, through you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, we would have to uh, we'd have to look into that. Um, I know we did get back some from legal uh, recently that um, they're looking at or what they've, they've uh, requested us to consider is um, a first offense and subsequent offenses. So the fines are substantially higher in that sense. They're $10,000 up to that for the first offense if convicted under a part three ticket. And a second subsequent offense would be up to $50,000. The issue is having a witness of who's... Um, discarding the refuge, if you would. Um, and they, we need that witness or we need the information of the individual that's discarded it. And in most cases, there's no information on couches and such on to tag that to an actual individual. Madam Chair, can I have a quick follow up? Yes. Yeah, I was just wondering, have we ever looked at the possibility, especially in some of these areas of using some sort of uh, tree cams or something? You know, the prices of these things have come down substantially over the years. And you could put one up on a post somewhere just to pick up license plate numbers. You know, and they could be moved around. Um, three, Madam Chair. Um, that is something that we can review and uh, with provide back associated costs and enforcement abilities with that. Okay, thank you. Is there any other council members that would like to speak uh, during this first? Uh, okay, I've got Councilor Roberts, Mayor Ferguson. That's it. Okay, Councilor Roberts. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm not sure if this question is directed to Todd or Mike or Andy, if he's on, on here, but the issue of uh, trash and litter in our rural areas is really significant. Um, I don't know if it's, you know, speaks to higher penalties or the use of GoPro cameras or whatever, but it is a really serious issue. Um, 
here in Sophiasburg, we've had to create our own annual Sophiasburg trash bash to at least make a dent in the litter and trash. I mean, Foster's Road is treated like a dump um, um, as similarly County Road 15 and a lot of our crossroads. It's, 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 it's terrible really. Uh, thankfully, with the help of Shire Hall staff and with the Women's Institute and our Sophiasburg Recreation Committee, we've been able to put in a, make a dent. But um, it is a major issue, and I think it has to be treated as seriously as settlement area uh, litter and trash because it's truly getting out of hand. So I would like to know how we plan to deal with that, please. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, Andy Harrison here. Um, with regard to the littering, as Mike said, uh, without actually witnessing the, uh, the perpetrator throwing the garbage out, what we have to do for bylaw enforcement is basically sift through any garbage to find any letters or identifying mail or something that we can track it back to the person that has thrown it out. Um, and we have looked at, and Mike and I have talked about these um, motion sensor cameras for locations such as Bryant Road in Amelia'sburg, Foster Road would be another one to basically have the cameras at either end of the road. You could watch the vehicle go in, or as soon as they go by, you could see what's in the vehicle. And then when they come out, you can see what's not in the vehicle. And then uh, I know Mike has been working with our solicitor on the enforcement capabilities and how that would hold up in court for enforcement of the, the offense. So it's basically, we have to really catch somebody or find information within the garbage to identify someone or these um, motion sensor cameras on some of these, let's say isolated roads that are very popular for dumping and see what we can put in place uh, to monitor those roads. Like uh, Councillor Forrester mentioned Airport Road is, is a, a big spot. Um, there's also Benway Cross Road in Hillier. There's, there's a number of them. And I know we've looked at the cost of these cameras and they are in the $500 per camera range. We don't know what the maintenance portion is. And it's also, this is another one of the enforcement uh, features or items that was brought up by council or by our count, um, solicitor was to ensure that we are consistent as to how we monitor these cameras, how often we're looking at the video and, and, and to be able to enforce and charge people by using surveillance. Anything further? <clears throat> okay, uh, Mayor Ferguson. Can I just, uh, there was something. Okay, first. sorry, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. So does that mean we are developing a plan? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, we are looking at it. We haven't put it in this current um, edition of the, the littering bylaw, but it, it, I don't think it would have to be included per se in the bylaw as an enforcement piece. Um, it would just be how we move forward with a uh, prosecution based on uh, video surveillance. Thank you, Andy. Okay, Mayor Ferguson. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> this is to, um, to Todd. Thanks a lot, Todd, for the, uh, the report and the work you put into it. Just a comment about patios. I, I um, agree with what you said about um, giving them an additional hand for 2021. Uh, it's a very peculiar dance we've been going through since the start of COVID with openings, closings, adjusting this, adjusting that. And I know our food service providers have been particularly hard hit. But Councillor Nyman's point about parking is, is well taken. So this is you know, an initiative for 2021, and I'm fully supportive of that. I do have a question about the food truck operators and the recommendation in point four 
um, about the consultation process. Can you clarify what that uh, consultation process will involve, how it will be undertaken and who will be involved? I note you used the word, uh, the consultation will involve operators. So does that mean operators of trucks? Does that mean operators of uh, bricks and mortar? Just some, some clarification, because I wanna make sure that all the mm -hmm. affected pro um, parties have an opportunity to participate in this and uh, will become part of the report. Sure, uh, through the chair, back to the mayor. Uh, so to answer your question, the consultation process we envision related to food trucks. So there's been some work done. When I speak to operators, what I speak particularly to are the food truck operators. And there was some work done uh, through the Chamber of Commerce related to the food truck bylaw and its, in its um, um, current form. They have some thoughts. They've, con they've got some operators together and had some questions. I think uh, it's worthwhile getting further operators who work in that environment to provide some feedback as to what the current bylaw, licensing bylaw looks like and what the, we would envision in the future. I also think that there's a role to play. And what I say, when I mean industry, I mean more along the lines of the bricks and mortar businesses and, and uh, hospitality-based industries uh, and some of the industries that have uh, current space for food trucks. So for example, uh, the, the, the food trucks are, 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 are allowed in the RU zones and they're predominantly used at uh, rural businesses like wineries. Um, and so we would encourage those businesses that have some impact to participate, but we'd also encourage, are, are encouraging the bricks and mortar restaurants. I've had a lot of conversation with them once uh, we brought forward this report and certainly would include what I've heard to date and encourage others to participate. I feel like um, some of that work will be done in public forums, like through the Community Economic Development Commission. Some of that consultation will be done through direct surveys to the various businesses and industries and allow for the general public to give some feedback. Uh, and some of that work will be done through focus groups where we bring together the business associations or, or the, in the businesses that are generally impacted, whether it's operators or food service industry and get their feedback to inform our report. We are trying to be pretty nimble uh, and pretty quick. Um, unlike something like, uh, I mean, uh, just as an example, we had a long conversation in the tourism management discussion on the 28th related to fire uh, or cooking uh, um, outdoor barbecuing in parks. And while that also needs some consultation, um, the reality is, is when we make a when council makes a decision about how they want to proceed with that in a bylaw, uh, that can be implemented and, and that could come in May or, or, or late May even and be implemented for the season. And it's just a rule that has to be abided by and enforced. Whereas if we're going to change the, the food truck bylaw, I wanted to do that in a short period of time, but relatively quickly so that those impacts could be addressed in the 2021 operating season. Um, so that's why we brought that to you today and are asking for some direction to do that consultation because knowing it's going to take some time to do the consultation, but not only that, once any changes have been accepted by council, then we have to get industry to um, um, come into compliance so that they can operate in the season, which is why we're asking for it to come forward and we're giving it a short period of time. Incidentally, we would like to, if we get consent or, or uh, um, council has provided some indication we would like to move really to really quickly to do the consultation piece. Okay, just, just as long as a very okay. wide net is being cast, that was my, uh, my yes. point. So thank you very much for clarifying. No problem. Councillor Prinson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm just going to go into the littering bylaw for a second here. Um, so there's, yes, sir. from the, from the chatter we've had, there's two types of litter. There's the, the day trippers that are throwing their Tim Hortons and McDonald's and fast food stuff out that, uh, from, from staff, it sounds, there's not a whole lot we can do about that, but pick it up, um, is, is the way I'm reading. And then the second, the second amount of, uh, litter we're talking is the stuff that gets dumped, the couches on airport or fosters or whatever road. 
So just just putting it out there and maybe looking at this from a different angle, but those are people that are residents of this community. What if we, as a council, gave a gave a free dump day or two a year and then we don't have to pick up this garbage? You know, like this is a different, instead of buying $500 GoPros and stuff, we advertise, you know, these two days are free dump days. You have to show proof of residence or a tax bill or something, you know, and you can take, um, you know, a, a p big piece of couch or something to our landfills. So I just, you know, I don't think there's anything we can do about the, the fast food bags and stuff like that. Now you find mass on the road, you know, that's the newest thing too. The mass from work gets thrown out the window. So I just, I'd like to throw a different approach at this. And why don't we, as a, as a council get behind our residents and say, okay, we have two free dump days a year. These are the dump days. So I I'll just put that out there and see, see where it goes. So thanks. Okay. Got Councillor Margotson and Councillor Bailey. Anyone else that wants to speak on this item? Councillor McNaughton. Okay, go ahead, Councillor Margotson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just uh, briefly uh, on the patio bylaw, I support the extension of the timing and the relief on the fees. And we did do it last summer and hopefully the parking on that summer, we didn't have the issues that we uh, contemplated might happen. So I support it, but I also want to comment that I support that the businesses do their share in the, in the garbage removal um, that I, I didn't make a comment. I just asked about clarification, but I support businesses doing their share on that too. And on the litter, I, I want to, uh, I'm right on the same line of thinking as Councillor Prinzen. I commend staff for putting the signage at the drive throughs and the takeout restaurants. I think that's a very important encouraging, uh, encouraging people as they pick up from a drive through not to litter. And that signage I think is important. We may want signage as people come into the county that we're a anti-littering zone and we don't, you know, we look very unfavorably upon that. That's the tourist part of it. And the like Councillor Prinzen said, I was thinking exact same thing. We did it before these free landfill or transfer site days. But I think when we communicate that, we should be very blunt and say, you know, instead of driving down the back road with your couch or your electric stove or TV, here's a free day and well advertise it so people can take advantage of it. I don't think we're ever going to solve the littering problem, but hopefully we can start a communication process that will encourage people to look at alternatives. So I, I, that's my comment and thank you for the report, Todd. All right. Councillor Bailey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I had a two-parter, but Councillor Prinzen took care of the first part. I agree fully, we should have at least a couple of free dump days. I had a note uh, on that yesterday. Todd, one of the things I'm wondering if you're considering is Will you be thinking about how food truck locations will be allocated? My reason for asking this is if you're looking at the Wellington Beach and I had a food truck, I'd want to be there. And I'd imagine a number of other people will want that because it will be a prime location. Are we looking at how those will be allocated when we look at the bylaw? Uh, through the chair back to Councillor Bailey, I don't disagree with you. Public spaces to have things like food trucks would be very coveted spots. There would be, as we do our review, I mean, uh, I'm asking for the ability to have the review to make that, have that conversation to see what the, what's currently impossible could be made possible. Uh, but certainly we wouldn't just sort of say, hey, a food truck can be here first come first serve. I, I think there's also an ability for fees and charges to be applied. We could make some money. Uh, by renting space at the Wellington Beach. Um, and there would have to be some sort of process as to how we would determine. We, uh, you know, much the same as um, um, my comments related to the Picton skate park slash a splash pad where we have a canteen that's very constrained by space and bricks and it's, it's already there, but uh, it's challenging to get an operator for. I think when we allow, uh, if we allowed a food truck in that area, it may change the dynamic of what that recruitment process is for food services at those types of locations. And, and so it would, you know, I, I mean, I'm, I don't, 
I don't, I'm not wedded to something in particular, but I, I would envision some sort of competitive process where we person pays for, you know, applies to, uh, is vetted and then would pay for access to those spaces. But that certainly, it doesn't happen until we, to do, until we do some site of review on the program itself and the licensing. So, uh, I mean, I, I don't wanna get too far out ahead of me and myself. Uh, or, or uh, out ahead on this process, but uh, or what the outcome might be, but um, because I really want public input as to what this looks like going forward. However, I mean, certainly those things are possible. They're not possible currently, but they could be possible in the future. Thanks, Ty. Your answer is exactly what I was looking for. Um, Councillor McNaughton. Thank you. Just briefly. So um, further to the discussion about uh, businesses um, contributing to their their own um, products waste disposal. So we did have a number of complaints, at least in Picton last year, were related to specific businesses that did have quite a lot of um, takeout refuse that was left deposited at, in sort of around their uh, vicinity. And that was bricks and mortar restaurants, one takeout restaurant, which or one drive through restaurant. Um, and there was no requirement at that time for, um, for businesses, including drive throughs to provide any sort of uh, receptacle for refuse. And I understand business owners being concerned about um, being concerned about the dumping of household waste. Um, but if there was a mechanism in which we could actually uh, in which the municipality could actually work with um, high volume garbage producers, specific high volume garbage producers. If that comes into being, I would support that happening. There are municipalities that require drive through restaurants to have uh, receptacles available during business hours. Uh, and we don't have that here. And we've got at least one uh, drive through operator who, who doesn't have anything on site within uh, the um, reach of the public. Uh, and I, I think it would be um, something that would, um, some sort of mechanism that would allow for negotiation with, with high volume producers. I think a mechanism like that would be um, a good idea. So just wanted to say that. Is there anyone else on council that would like to speak to this item? Okay, I'm gonna take my, uh, I'm gonna take my few, uh, few minutes. Um, I support. Yeah, Councillor Maynard, but Councillor yeah. Forster has his hand up as well. Okay, sorry, that's why I ask. <laughs> Go ahead, Councillor Forrester. Thank you. Uh, Todd, this question for you. Uh, with the food trucks, will we be having discussions with the provincial park? And secondly, more specifically, has anybody ever thought of uh, maybe a portable Tim Hortons coffee truck that would be in the provincial park area? And I say this from experience, knowing just in my park, I would say on average a day that I see three or four of my customers driving into town just to go to Tim Hortons to get coffee. And I'm a small park. I can't even imagine the amount of people that are coming out of the provincial park every day to go into driving into town, which puts more use on our roads, traffic downtown, and just congestion that could be solved with maybe a coffee truck. It, and I think it pretty much has to be a Tim Hortons or a McDonald's one. It couldn't be a, mm -hmm. you know, just somebody selling coffee and maybe coffee and donuts. And that could probably take a lot of traffic in our area. So I think we have to have this discussion with the provincial park also. Uh, through the chair back to Councillor Forrester. Unfortunately, I didn't hear your first question because it broke up a little bit, but the second question, that's a very good idea. and certainly worthwhile having that conversation with the provincial park and or any of the rural properties that could host uh, the, uh, some type of uh, coffee-based business like a Tim Hortons uh, 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 truck or, or, or um, um, RV or whatever. You see them oftentimes when they rebuild the Tim Hortons, you see those at those places. I know exactly what you're speaking to. I think it's a great business opportunity. I hopeful that the, uh, you know, one of our local business people are watching today and have that great idea and, and want to move forward to it with it. But I also agree that 
Um, you know, that would help certainly alleviate a lot of pressure in the community uh, with vehicles if uh, those services were more uh, available to the to places where people are staying and congregating. So certainly that those types of opportunities should be made available and would be certainly reviewed in a food truck bylaw. Now, if you would be kind enough to give me your first question, I'd be happy to answer. I think it was it was all mixed around that, but I was specifically talking about having a Tim Hortons because people are going for Tim Hortons, not yeah. just to get coffee. They can get it in the park. They can get it around this area here, but they're driving to town to get Tim Hortons coffee. I don't disagree, sir. Um, Madam CAO, do you have a comment? No? Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to take them, I guess, in order on the uh, outdoor patios. Um, mm -hmm. I, I support the uh, the no fees for this year and uh, as limited a number of parking spaces as we can lose as possible. I notice in the revised bylaw, there's um, a lot on the um, on the fire safety, and I'm just wondering if, uh, like most restaurants should have, like if if all anyone that had a patio, if they had to have the restaurant had to have a, a, a fire safety plan, it would be, that's really all you need to say is you need to have a registered fire safety plan. Mm -hmm. And that would take care of all of those, uh, all of those issues in about five words. And, and I think it's, it's uh, like our restaurants in general should have them. Um, I know going into many that, that that they don't. They're fairly inexpensive to uh, to put together, and uh, just by the the scope of the comments that are in yellow on fire hazards. Um, further to that, uh, most patios, unless they're in a uh, more rural area, are not uh, really, in my opinion, conducive to uh, to barbecues. I know on most uh, um, patios in more urban areas. I know that in Babel that you, you can't, right? Have an open air barbecue out there. And finally on the patios, the um, <clears throat> most patios or, or restaurants would have some sort of a server station where there would be a garbage. I mean, if, as long as they don't make it right at the side of the, the fence, right? I think that that's a, a fair requirement to have them uh, have uh, some kind of garbage or server station on the patio. On the, um, I guess really on the, the littering, and I'm going to put this kind of with the, the food trucks on, on, the, on the beach, I think if we can get um, both our, our patios and any um, mobile, uh, mobile food vehicles to use more environmentally friendly products, we're likely to have maybe a little bit less, a uh, little bit less littering. And I noted in the comments, a place like Wellington Beach, there should be no plastic water bottles. I mean, people can, there are other ways of divvying out water to people, but we should be uh, where we can, absolutely uh, mandating what type of, um, <clears throat> what type of products that they, uh, that they are serving their commodities to their guests. So I would uh, strongly suggest that water bottles are the one thing that we should not be uh, that we should not be encouraging. Doesn't mean that you can't have uh, you know water on tap or you know put it in a paper cup, but uh, not uh, certainly not in a bottle. And on the um, on the on the food trucks, I know some places when you get a, a spot that's uh, highly valued. It's actually an open uh, bid process. So the, uh, somebody, if they qualify, then they, uh, whoever puts up, the, puts up the cash, and I think you'll, you'll find that you'll get in some locations that will be quite, uh, quite advantageous. My final comment is that I see that these are both, um, although we have drafts, there's been quite a few comments today. They're scheduled to come back to the February 23rd council meeting. And um, if I could get a secondary, I propose that those come back to the uh, Committee of the Whole at the 25th. That would just move it slightly to March 9th for Council. Because I think we've got, to, there's been quite a few comments. There's things that I'm sure will be added. We're only seeing drafts here that we should have a, another uh, 
should be able to look at it at a committee of the whole so that when it comes to council, it's, uh, you know, it's been well discussed and it's ready to, and it's ready to pass. I would second that. So I don't know whether I should you? have Councillor McNaughton make the motion, but uh, I mean, it's up for debate whether a chair can actually make a motion or not, or an amendment. I would be happy to. So through you, Madam Chair, if I may. So if um, I hear an amendment, and I know Councillor St. Jean also had an amendment. Um, if yeah, we'd like know. to move forward with those two, if Councillor McNaughton and St. Jean perhaps could move in second so that the chair remains neutral in this. Mayor Ferguson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a quick comment. Um, I fully agree with uh, the point Councillor Prinzen made, and I think he should be an op should be provided an opportunity to perhaps add the uh, the idea of the uh, dump days. There were a lot of people nodding their heads when he uh, he spoke. So, I, I, as I say, I don't want to lose sight of that. So, Councillor Prinzen, through the uh, mechanism or whatever mechanism, Madam Interim Clerk provides, if you want to bring that forward, I think. The people so, here would uh, support it. Thank you. If, if I may, what I was hoping would happen is through the through this discussion that that would help shape these uh, that that would help shape these bylaws instead of trying to put every single amendment to, on to uh, to these uh, to these bylaws or projected bylaws that are in front of us that we allow staff to take it back. And that was why, that was the rationale for having it come to a committee hall and then immediately to the following council meeting. Because I think there was quite a few different items discussed. And I'll ask uh, for uh, Commissioner Davis's. Uh, so it's not likely to come back in the form that we're seeing now. Back to the chair. Uh, so your question is, is so are you, I just want to get some clarification from my own perspective. You're asking to change recommendation number two in my four recommendations from uh, DRAC to, to bring an updated bylaw uh, to regulate patios. So two and three, you want to change from the 23rd meeting to the 25th meeting, which is another committee of the whole. Just those two bylaws, right? Or do you want to bring the whole thing back on the 25th? including the direction on food trucks? No, because no, they, the, because they have a later, they already have a later date. Sure. Okay, and, so you wanna bring back and, the bylaws and uh, what are you hoping to, just so, some direction maybe to staff, uh, me, um, what you're looking for is some changes or whatever we were dis was discussed today would be included in the draft uh, bylaws that I would present to you then on the 25th um, um, for further discussion and maybe further changes? Yes, yeah, so there's been numerous. I mean, I, I'm assuming it, that they've you've been making notes on the comments from, uh, yes, from the committee. Been... Yeah, so. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yes. Arguably, just as some some feedback, uh, or my you know what my position would be, you know, Councillor Prinzen's suggestion about uh, some uh, uh, free dump days or uh, or transfer to site days or whatever we're calling that, I'm not sure that those are appropriate in a bylaw. They don't necessarily need to be in the littering bylaw. That could come as a uh, as extraneous or or a direction from council or maybe a, a revised. Um, um, recommendation or uh, or something along those lines. I don't know if they need to be contained in the bylaw, but certainly if there's some changes to the various bylaws that are being contemplated or have been asked for, those changes will be incorporated and they can come back on the 25th. Uh, it just pushes out those dates until March 9th. But that's, I mean, another one of those I think is uh, for both of those, uh, those particular bylaws is not the end of the world. I, I mean, my goal with the patio one is to provide as much certainty to the hospitality uh, businesses in our community 
as soon as possible so they can start making plans for operations. Uh, acknowledging fully that when we got around to changing the patio bylaw or uh, making it more permissible last year, we didn't do it until May, uh, almost two weeks, only two weeks before the opening of the season. So, I mean, March is better than May. Um, you know, uh, February is even better, but that's fine. I mean, we can we can live with that. Um, Councillor, sorry, Councillor St. Jean, did you have your hand up? Yes, yes, I did. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I, I agree with what you were suggesting uh, with regards to a minor amendment. Um, I, the one part that, uh, with regards to part two, I don't think there were a whole lot of suggested changes to uh, the second motion with regards to the outdoor patios. So I don't, I don't know why that couldn't just remain as is. Uh, obviously, the biggest, most contentious part here has been the uh, 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 the littering bylaw. So I support an amendment that would change that uh, report back date. Uh, and, and with regards to the uh, mobile canteens and food trucks, the only amendment I was going to suggest is what I suggested earlier on in the meeting was uh, more being more specific to who's, who should be included in those consultations. But for the rest of it, I don't think there's a whole lot that uh, Mr. Davis doesn't quite understand that it can't move forward in a, in a more timely fashion. Again, other than the, the littering bylaw. So I'm not quite sure what I'm gonna suggest here other than let's make a couple of amendments, but let's keep some of these things moving forward like part two uh, uh, that are relatively straightforward. Hey, anyone else? Councillor Forrester. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, I was just wondering, uh, and I'm okay, I think, with the free garbage days, but uh, I'm assuming there's going to be budget implications uh, for that and where that money would be allocated from would be, I think, something would have to be put into report because it could be substantial. CAO Wallace has her hand up. Okay. Uh, through the chair. To Madam the Chair. The, the CEO Wallace would like yes. to speak? Yeah, yep. she's trying. <laughs> Through the chair uh, to council. So uh, in, uh, here's what I think I'm hearing. I think the patio bylaws, you have given us minor changes as it relates. I think that we can uh, take those uh, under consideration and bring them back um, with the revised bylaw. And, uh, and my recommendation is we keep that moving for February 23rd. Um, uh, in terms of um, bringing that back to council and, and it can be discussed at that time, but uh, if council wishes to come back to committee hall, I'm just not sure we have enough to write another report on. So I'd be looking for some more direction on that. As it relates to the littering bylaw, the issue about free days is a, is a good one. Um, it is part of a consideration of a waste report that is tracking to come to council uh, we owe a bigger conversation around a number of items in the waste side, and uh, we talked about it at budget. That report is tracking, it was March, but given that tourism is now taking up more of the agenda, we are likely pushing that to April. So there will be a conversation, but it would not be in the next report that would come back on the 25th. So whatever we would be bringing back on littering would be a rethinking of littering from an enforcement perspective, and I think maybe that does warrant a second conversation given that there seems to be a, a need to look at that in the context of both resident versus tourist, rural versus urban. There's probably a number of uh, elements we want to just double check we've got that bylaw correct. So my recommendation would be let that motion be revised with an amendment to come back on the 25th. The food truck I'd recommend we just keep moving forward because it's just consultation. And uh, um, and and the if, uh, Councillor St. Jean, I, I think that you're hearing from us at a staff level that we understand patios need to be widely consulted. If you would like, you can write that into the motion amendment, but um, I think you have our commitment. We understand that the businesses in the BIAs need to be have their voice heard. So are you, are you good with that, uh, Councillor St. Jean, that they take it as a direction on the uh, consultation on the, on the mobile food trucks or mobile food? Uh... Uh, Madam Chair, yes, yes, I am comfortable with that. 
Uh, there's no need to muddy the uh, motions any further. Okay. And uh, I would just uh, ask that, uh, I think they did mention Consecon, but I think uh, the other larger settlement areas as well, Rossmore in, in particular has, uh, you know, would, would certainly fall into that category. Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm, I'm just on the matter of consultation, which was referenced a, a, a second or so ago with regarding to food trucks. We, we license through uh, building and bylaw services, county food trucks, portable barbecues, refreshment vehicles. There's a, an application process. So will we be also be consulting with um, those food trucks that we have licensed? Through the chair to Council Roberts, yes, we would consult with those those that have been licensed, those that are licensed, and I and I failed to mention uh, and and I um, apologize that part of that consultation would be on would not just be with industry, the public operators who I would consider licensed food truck operators, CDC and the chamber, but we would also reach out to public health and the fire department. Uh, and our partners in safety to ensure that whatever whatever parts of that bylaw that they have some oversight on, we would be getting a feedback from them as well. That's terrific, Todd. Thank you. Okay, so there's a there is an, a motion on the floor. If we take the uh, and I'm I'm fine with the uh, you know the bringing the patios back at the bylaw at the twenty third, and I think staff has our direction moving the um, number three, I think the to the committee, the whole of the 25th was the recommendation and um, the other one is April 15th anyway. So Madam Clerk, do you want to, do we need somebody or can we just use that as a, uh, as a friendly? Through you, Madam Chair, I have something drafted and Councilor McNaughton has left, but if I could get a mover and seconder, this is the wording. That report CSP 05 2021 recommendation number three be amended to read as follows. That the proposed updated littering bylaw come forward to the February 25th, 2021 committee meeting for enactment and approval at the March 9th, 2021 council meeting. So that gives counts the staff clear direction that it's coming forward mm -hmm. as draft on the 25th and then it will be approved on March 9th. Is that good with everybody? Um, Councillor Roberts and then Councillor St. Jean. Sorry, Madam Chair, I thought I was just putting my hand up to volunteer to move or second something. Oh, okay. Thanks. Um, is, that what, is, is that what you're doing as well, Councillor St. Jean? Uh, exactly. Okay. That's what so I intended. The amendment yeah. by Councillor Roberts, seconded by Councillor St. Jean. All those in favor? And that carries. Now the main motion as uh, as amended. All in favor? Yes, Madam Chair, and call Do the vote. Read it again. Yeah. All in favor? And that carries as well. Okay, so we'll move to uh, six point three, the proposed new noise bylaw. If I can get someone to put that on the floor for a discussion, please. Councillor Bailey and Councillor Forrester. This is a Bailey Forrester motion that council receive report DS, sorry, uh, 29, 2021 for information and two that council direct staff to consult with the public and businesses on the new bylaw to regulate noise and return to council by May, 2021. Okay. Discussions, hands please. Anybody that would like to speak to this item? Just hold them up for a second. I've got Hirsch, Prinzen, Harper, Nyman. Okay, Councillor Hirsch. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'd like to compliment staff on, uh, on a very thorough report. Noise has been such an issue as we know from our, uh, from our email boxes um, and for a long time. Uh, you know, comparing other municipalities and the work they've done, this is, this is an excellent report. I have, I have one question and this would be for staff, I guess, in the first instance. 
Um, we continue in 2021 in this bylaw, in the proposed bylaw, to make a special exception for Sundays. And I'm just wondering what the logic is, other than the obvious one, which is a religious one. Uh, what is what is the logic in staff's view for uh, segregating out Sundays as a day when I uh, I cannot use my chainsaw apparently? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, uh, I've used the. Um City of Belleville's bylaw is a template for what you have before you. And it was one of their uh, recommendations. And it was more just for one day a week to keep the noise starting at later in the morning. So instead of being able to go out at seven in the morning to cut your grass or do whatever work, it was bumped to nine o'clock. So that, that's the only reason it's there. That can be amended uh, as per the discussion with public to see if it if it will hold up or if there's enough pushback to say Sunday should be treated the same as any other day of the week. Follow Certainly I'd, I'd, I'd be in favor of it being the same as any other day of the week. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Prinson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I was going along the same lines as Councillor Hirsch and you know, I'm not going to pick this apart as it is going out to public for for commentary and for review. But, you know, there's some people that work six days a week. And then, you know, if they have a tree go down the yard, they have to clean up on Sunday or the holiday. So those are the only things. And I understand, you know, trying to keep it quiet one day or however, but I just, I'd like to remember those people that are putting in six days a week. And, you know, I see you can make an exemption 45 days, but nobody knows if your tree is going to fall down your backyard 45 days before it falls. So I'm not going to pick it apart too much. I'll look forward to after public consultation and then uh, we'll see where we go from there. But thanks for Councillor Hirsch for bringing that forward first. Thanks. Okay, uh, Councillor Harper. Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, thanks, Andy. Just wanted to clarify um, in the one area where we're um, considering commercial property that is adjacent to a residential um, uh, neighborhoods, I suppose. I'm thinking of in Wellington, the Lakeside Motel is something that we we had a fair bit of flare up on this one last summer and I expect they'll be popular again this year. So just wondering um, how you're thinking about something like that. I noticed in the report you referenced uh, in this uh, sort of on this issue, you say provide a limitation of noise uh, from music and entertainment in commercial and institutional zones and then prohibit between the hours of 11 p.m. and 10 a.m. So I see two things. One is uh, you've changed it from 2 a.m. to 11 p.m. If I understood that right, because I think they had a 2 a.m. before. I, I think that's uh, what I remember. But then it's just what do we mean by provide a limitation of a noise? Just uh, do you have some further thoughts on, on how we deal with the fact that uh, uh, technically they're allowed to be, uh, you know, operating and, and playing music, but uh, what can we expect in that uh, in that department? Uh, through you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, that was put in there, I think, to address the biggest concern was there was no limitation right through till two in the morning previously for anything outside of a residential zone for, for noise. So that was the reasoning behind the 11 o'clock. Typically, we I'm, I'm hoping for some direction with regard to whether it's an outdoor venue or an indoor venue. Uh, and how it relates to the noise that's going to be, let's say, coming from those uh, places of business. Typically, I'm looking at like a commercial venue as an indoor uh, space, similar to the Legion Hall or somewhere where you're, or even the Picton Arena, where you would have a dance and loud music taking place till midnight or, or later. And, or, these outdoor venues, I know uh, a couple of years ago, I put forward an amendment uh, to reduce outdoor uh, venues and noise to a reduced area and time or a reduced time limit, trying to keep it to 11 o'clock or midnight, similar to what they do in uh, Belleville, I know with their um, uh, waterfront entertainment and when they had the Empire Square those uh, concerts had to be shut down at 11 o'clock uh, without exception. So I'm trying to get some direction on that and, and have that as a starting point 
to to see where we end up with relation to, like you mentioned, the Lakeside Inn is going to be a very contentious issue because it is going to be an open air in a very, uh, let's say, tight community. Very All the residents are fairly close to that property. So that's one of the, the oddities that, that I'm going to have to look at a little more carefully with some public input. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Nyman. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, I agree with Councillor Hirsch, Hirsch and uh, Councillor Prinson. Uh, Sunday and holiday is treated the same as any other day. Um, there's a couple different reasons. In the summer, a lot of people cut their grass early in the morning or late afternoon due to the heat. Um, it'll be out there in the uh, high noon cutting grass. They'll do it, you know, when it's a little bit cooler. Uh, the chainsaw, I have an issue with. A lot of people use uh, wood as their primary heat during the winter. As Councillor Prinzing said, a lot of people work. Um, home at four or five o'clock in the afternoon and they want to cut some wood for the winter, prepare for the winter. You know, the way it says here, five o'clock, well, you know, they can't do it. So I'd like to see that extended. Um, even on the weekends, on a Saturday, you know, they'll start at seven o'clock and work after five o'clock. Uh, if they're doing that in the, in the summer. So uh, I think we're restricting it too much there. So I'd like to see that change too. But if it's going out to the public, hopefully the public will have comments on that too, so. Is there anyone else that would like to speak to this? Councillor Forrester, Councillor St. Jean. Councillor Forrester, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just getting back to what Andy was talking about, looking for a little bit of direction. Uh, for the noise, and I'm glad this is sort of coming back with a little bit more hope now. Like I've had problems with this for years, being in a <coughs> excuse me, more probably a little more heavily tourist tourist area, but it has spread out to other people now. Uh, indoor outdoor venues, when it comes to noise, uh, we can have the same problems, even though it is it is indoors. When they have barn doors, they open up and then run till one or two or three in the morning time, this has been issues in the past. So I, I think Andy, that they have to be treated the same 11 o'clock when, <coughs> excuse me, it seems like whenever we've managed to keep it to 11 o'clock, everybody at least is somewhat happy with that. They might not fully agree with it, but they can live with it. But when it goes into one and two in the morning, then it's a different story. So that's the direction I'd like to see there is still at 11 o'clock quiet time. Okay, and uh, Councillor St. Jean. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a, a couple of comments, and, and, and I'm sure you're going to hear some of these comments from the public when it gets circulated. Uh, greater, as we all know, there's been great concern about uh, industrial noise. I don't think I need to go any further with that one. And uh, how this noise bylaw will uh, attempt to address or hopefully fully address some of the uh, issues with regards to industrial noise, blasting, whatever. Um, just a comment there. Uh, something I noticed the, uh, and, and maybe, it's, maybe it's an error, maybe an oversight with regards to uh, penalties. The penalties for an individual and the penalties for a corporation are identical. And I think we can all agree that a uh, $1,000 fine for an individual would not be the same as a $1,000 fine for a corporation. Uh, generally in the past, we've seen quite, quite a bit, you know, there's usually a difference. Uh, so I would hope that that gets addressed and I'm sure there will be comments from the public on that as well. Um, under the schedule, there's, uh, there's one funny one, I, at least I find it humorous anyways, but uh, to start with uh, number 11 under schedule A, talks about uh, sound emitting pest control devices. Um, I know generally people are gonna interpret that as bird bangers for wineries and, and, and other agricultural uses, but uh, noise emitting devices for pests can be operated in the evening and the dark hours. 
Um, somebody who has fresh corn, sweet corn, may want to operate a bird banger to keep raccoons and other pests out. So I think there should be some consideration for an agricultural exemption there. Uh, the other one that, as I mentioned, that I find kind of humorous is how do you define yelling, shouting, hooting, <laughs> or similar sounds? Um, I think that one might be difficult to enforce. Are children hooters? Are children shouters? Possibly. Uh, and, and because I don't like children, should I be able to complain and have the parents of those children charged uh, a fine for making noise while they're being children? I think there's going to be some difficulties with that uh, number 10, particularly. So just my observations, uh, and I look forward to seeing what, uh, uh, what comes back to us when the, the public has had a chance. I'm sure they'll find a lot more things that they don't like than I ever will. Thank you. Anyone else? No? Okay, I uh, <clears throat> just, with this noise bylaw and the change from any kind of a mechanical um, monitoring system, it's going to be a judgment call. And when we use words in the, you know, um, any noise from residents that is of loud volume or continuous duration that creates a nuisance or is likely to disturb the inhabitants of any dwelling without limiting the generality of the foregoing includes, you know, radio, TV. Um, so, <laughs> Yes, we may have problems between neighbors or certain people making noise, but how, like, how do you make a judgment call on what is a reasonable amount of noise? I mean, we still have to live. We were all under 30 at some point. I mean, or have kids or have had a dog or how do we, uh, how do we balance that? Uh, because reading this in the, this draft, people would say, well, it's, it's disturbing me. So I want it to stop and I want you to make it stop. <laughs> uh, through you, Madam Chair, uh, through discussions with the, uh, uh, the OPP and the uh, staff commander, uh, John Hatch, he, he liked this position as a discretionary uh, item for the officers. Uh, basically, you, most people have a, a, a good idea of what is loud music or what's disturbing to your neighbor. So if you've got, let's say, a, an amplified stereo going off in your backyard and it's been going on for hours and hours and you can hear it three houses away, then with that discretionary ability, they can say, yes, you are disturbing. It may not just have to be the neighbor next door, but it could be two doors down. So he liked the ability to have that discretion for their officers to say, yes, it is uh, disturbing and it is in a violation of the noise bylaw. Okay. And um, I agree and clawed back a little bit, maybe the, uh, the noise from our, um, we'll call them bars, but I mean, I think pretty much every uh, bar or uh, uh, licensed facility in the county is located, uh, you know, somewhere near residence. So is that, is this effectively saying that uh, all entertainment at licensed facilities, unless they turn it down to a, uh, <laughs> to virtually nothing would be, would be effectively prohibited? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, I th the intent is to try to limit the noise, especially for let's say the restaurants, bars, the indoor venues, because they do have the ability to basically close the doors and, and keep most of the noise in. Uh, the original bylaw, when it was debated several years ago and got bumped to two in the morning, was to protect the, uh, the bar owners at the time that were on Main Street in Picton, because we had uh, two or three that were just opening up and that was the, the position of council at the time. And that's how it ended up being so uh, wide open for everything other than a residential area that the noise could go on until two in the morning. Um, those times can be um, amended depending on the, uh, 
the consultation from the bar owners and the, uh, the, the people that operate these venues that rely on entertainment and uh, social events. Just one on the, uh, I mean, I, we always thought that maybe that these, um, these uh, testing devices, these noise meters would uh, give us a, you know, something that was not, you know, that was solid and not, uh, not up to, not discretionary. If we looked at other devices or if we had more devices, would we be able to rotate them through so that we could have them calibrated? There any I'm just throwing these out there. Um, you know, is there any opportunity to train our staff to calibrate these devices? Because it, you know. Yeah, through you, Madam Chair, it is an option, and uh, we could look at that. Um, it's it's a it's the cost of the the equipment and the cost of maintenance for the equipment, and also we would have to supply the OPP with the equipment because they are the ones responding mm -hmm. to, let's say 95% of the calls after hours. Okay, so that's the sort of stuff that once it's been brought up, right, can be incorporated into the final report? Yes, it could. Okay, anything further? And you'll have to remind me, Madam Clerk, did I actually get somebody to put this one on the floor? Yes, you did. Okay. Come. Bailey Forrester. Okay, anything further? Um, any amendments? All in favor? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, that passes. Okay, uh, 6.4. Um, Councillor St. Jean, would you like to put this on the floor and I'll give you an opportunity to uh, speak to it? Uh, yes, thank there. you, Madam Chair. Yes, I do, uh, Councillor Roberts. Uh, so okay. this is a St. Jean Roberts motion that staff be directed to prepare a report outlining how affordable housing is calculated in Prince Edward County and the options available through land use planning to achieve affordable ownership and rental housing, particularly within the Picton, Wellington and Rossmore secondary plans, and that the report be brought forward to a committee of the whole meeting before the end of June, 2021. Uh, and thank you for allowing me to speak to it first. Um, first, let me say that uh, contrary to recent media coverage, this is not about one particular solution to affordable housing. Um, I wanna make that very clear. I don't like it when people put words in my mouth and uh, I wanna get that off, off the top. What this is about is reviewing, uh, first of all, defining clearly for not just council, but for the public, what is affordable housing in Prince Edward County? What does it mean? What is that dollar amount? Once you've achieved that, in my view, then you can formulate a plan to tackle the problem. We all know it's a problem. <clears throat> So a conjecture about, you know, is it this, is it that, is not good. And I feel there are a number of ways that we can address it. Uh, and thank you to the CAO for suggesting the, the second part with regards to the uh, uh, land use plan uh, available, avail pardon me, options available through land use planning. They are not just uh, uh, limited to inclusionary zoning. There are a number of issues, a number of ways to address it. And quite surprisingly, back in May of 2015, there was a housing policy implement, implementation report that was brought forward to council that outlines quite clearly in 57 page, the 57 pages of its uh, thickness that uh, there are many ways we could achieve this. But before we go that route, you need to know what the problem is you're trying to solve. You need to start from somewhere. So my, my intent here is to let's define it, let's get a number on it so that we can move forward. Uh, we had a, a great conversation, at least two now, uh, uh, during planning sessions about affordable housing. So I think it's time we move forward and we, we 
we owe it to the public to explain to them exactly what that means in Prince Edward County. Um, in a response to an email the, that I received from a ratepayer uh, on this subject matter, I very clearly said that, you know, I understand people are going to be angry. They are going to be upset in many ways when they see the truth, but we owe them the truth. We owe it to the public to let them know this is what the reality is in Prince Edward County. And we also owe it to them to move forward and actually do something about it instead of letting a, a, a six-year-old document languish that has a ton of great information, great resources, and we spend taxpayers' money on it. Let's use it. So anyways, that's the intent of my motion. And uh, uh, I hope to uh, hope the council will support it and that staff will be able to achieve this and help us to move forward on this critical issue. Thank you. Okay, would anybody else like to uh, speak to this item? Councillor Harper. Yeah, thanks, Madam Chair. I'm in favor of it, uh, Phil, I think it's great. Uh, my only question would be, does it have implications for the official plan that we're about to pass? and what language we use in reference to affordable housing in the official plan. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, to Councillor Harper. Um, I believe there will be some implications. Um, in fact, the, the housing policy uh, implementation report was part of the original uh, review of the uh, official plan. And a lot of those recommendations were intended to be included in the official plan. I think some have been. Uh, there's a ton of reading to do to make sure that that happens. Uh, but yes, I believe there will be some, some things that need to be implemented in the OP. And there may very well be some modifications to uh, all three secondary plans that will come out of this. But it's not something that's going to happen overnight. It's going to take time. And that's why... Uh, uh, I suggest that uh, by the end of Q2, uh, in consultation with the CAO, that it's, it's doable to come up with the answers that I'm to the question that I'm asking or the direction we're giving in the motion. Okay, got Councillor Roberts and then Councillor Bailey. Well, I'd just like to commend, thank you, Madam Chair. I'd just like to commend Councillor St. Jean for bringing this motion forward. Um, I think it's, once again, a very, very important uh, motion and we've identified it as our number one priority in the past affordable housing. In terms of the repository for the data that is generated, it, it might be helpful to receive a, as part of this report a staff recommendation with regard to um, where that data rests and who is responsible for updating it. Um, I think originally, Councillor St. Jean might have was thinking about it every six months. Um, I, I think it's, my own opinion is, I think it's once we get the template right, uh, it could be updated, you know, quarterly. And given the dynamic housing market, I think quarterly is perhaps uh, just about right in terms of frequency. But should it rest with uh, Shire Hall? Should it rest with our Prince Edward County Affordable Housing Corporation? I think... I think that responsibility, if it could be at least thought about in the staff report coming forward, that would be useful because as Councillor St. Jean references, things that get measured uh, get addressed. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Bailey. I think Councillor Roberts just covered what I had in mind. Um, I wanna make sure that there is consultation with the Housing Corporation because obviously, um, those of us on the housing corporation are getting a lot done, working pretty hard toward a goal, but I guess what I'm looking for here is uh, hopefully the housing corporation is heading in the right direction. So whatever happens, I hope somebody does consult with, especially uh, Chuck Dowdell. He's doing such a good job working with what he's got. Uh, just that can we make sure that they get consulted? Thank you. Councillor Margotson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I just want to reinforce that the last council did set up the Affordable Housing Corporation and this discussion and part of this motion keeps reoccurring. And we, 
and the, the Affordable Housing Corporation was set up to address this. And I think I had a stack of reports that came up to my knee when I, when I started. So there's plenty of information out there and, and preparing a report outlining how affordable housing is calculated. I, I'm really hoping that the Affordable Housing Corporation and the executive director is involved in this because I don't wanna reinvent the re wheel and, and create more work for our staff when we did set up the housing corporation. The land use planning aspect of this, while I'm a bit skeptical, I, I feel that it's something that the Affordable Housing Corporation has not tackled and perhaps we can align ourselves better with the municipality and the land use planning department because, and I do remember before I was on council, the staff challenged a developer to include affordable housing in the development proposal. And I had the results of all that and what we had in our, our uh, planning documents at that time were not sufficient to uh, require the developer to include affordable housing. And I, and I think it is a difficult aspect, but, but I'm, I'm certainly welcome the opportunity to explore it. But I guess my point is, don't forget that you set up the Affordable Housing Corporation, the previous council, we've got one going. So let's not chase our tail on this. So that's my comment. Thank you. Anyone else? <clears throat> Option weigh in quite as often as the chair, but I, I, I commend your, uh, your, um, your, your motion, and uh, I understand what Councillor Margaretson is saying. I think this is a, a directive. I, I would, however, when it says housing, particularly in Picton, Wellington, and the Rossmore secondary plans, I think that we, I would prefer that we're that we're saying you know housing with within the county. Um, because there may be some rural areas that are probably now actually are providing some affordable housing that we don't want to, uh, <clears throat> rental housing in particular, that we don't want to lose. And there is, uh, should be still on the radar, the upcoming Kazakhan Caring Place secondary plan. So, I mean, that's, that's just direction, I guess, or, you know, through Councillor St. Jean, right, that we, that we don't lose track of the, uh, the historic capacity of our rural areas to provide at least rural rental housing and uh, that that there is i think still a upcoming um Cuscon caring place secondary plan maybe i can ask uh, ca wallace is, is that broad enough i mean i don't really want to start amending or have somebody amend that but I, I think uh, through the chair to the council, I think that that is clear. Um, I, I certainly think we would start this with looking at the context overall planning in general, but I, um, I read the motion as the um, focus on the secondary plans because that's where the bulk of the planning applications come from. But uh, I, I, I think this is enough direction. I can ensure that we look at it in a rural context as well. And yes, we are still getting a secondary plan for Consecon Care in place. <laughs> um, Councillor Nyman. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just trying to understand I, I'm listening to Councillor Margison, but I also hear what Councillor St. Jean is saying too. But I'm all on the same lines. I don't want to be doing double the work again. So I'd like to understand a little bit more. I don't know who can provide the information, but if I heard it right, Councilor Margaretson said they've done a lot of this uh, work. So, what, if we already have, or somebody already has that work done, can we not draw from that? Do we have to have staff to work together. do that when it's already been done by? A corporation that we set up. Good. Yes, uh, CEO Wallace. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, to Councillor Nyman. So, uh, the way I would see us proceeding is absolutely. There's a lot of uh, information and expertise in the housing corporation, and I think that they 
um, will very uh, adeptly be able to answer the first part of this, which is the, the way affordable housing is measured. The way I see this report is that um, the housing corporation can work one project at a time. And the question to us as staff is what else could we be doing given the fact that council approves a myriad of uh, projects every month? What else could we be doing with our planning tools to achieve housing outcomes beyond the, the single projects that the housing corporation focuses on? And uh, so we will definitely work closely with the housing corporation on this and, uh, and try to bring back a report that respects what they have learned and know and, and also what has come before council before. And did you still want to speak, Councillor St. Jean? Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I recognize what Councillor Margaretson has said uh, uh, with regards to the information that's at um, uh, in, in the Affordable Housing Corporation hands. And I, I guess um, what I've been feeling and hearing, more particularly from, from residents, is that they don't understand what affordable housing truly is. And if we already have that information available to us, uh, Councillor Roberts touched on a, a single repository. I think that information needs to be more readily available. Um, we have pockets of information sitting around. The Affordable Housing Corporation has the bulk of it, but it's not, not for any nefarious reason or anything, not being publicly shared in a way that is easily accessible. And that's, I think, what, what I, uh, part of what I want to address uh, and, and maybe the motion could have been a little more clear uh, just simply by adding in consultation with the uh, Affordable Housing Corporation because recognizing that there is all of that, that uh, background information there. Um, so that, that may, maybe the motion could have been a little more clear, but I think we've, uh, through what I've said and what other councillors have said, uh, I believe staff get the nut of it and hopefully we'll be able to, to address what it is that I'm looking to have addressed here in this motion. And a Councillor Roberts. Oh, sorry. I'll come back to Councillor Harper. Sorry, I didn't see your hand. Sorry, does Councillor Harper want to go next? Uh, no, go ahead. You're thank, on now. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yes, I, th I think the notion of a, a central repository that is uh, available to all stakeholders in the public is, is pretty important. You know, perhaps what I made my earlier comment, it, you know, I, I wasn't clear enough, but, you know, my belief is that the Prince Edward County Affordable Housing Corporation is the logical repository for, for such a, a, an updated database and ideally, as I said, on a quarterly basis. But I think there's quite a bit of work that, that uh, Chuck and, and the Housing Corporation have not been able to get at in, uh, in uncovering true affordability. It's one thing to play riffs off uh, the CMHC in the province, but, but if you really want to look uh, at affordability in the county, I think we've got to be even more granular with regard to average household income in the county. And you know that is kind of census driven uh, information, but that lags by five to seven years. So you know, if we're talking about quarterly being important to be updated, something that's seven years old in determining that household affordability or rental affordability is not all that useful. And to get to that kind of granular data is a lot of work and it will take a lot of input from uh, employers uh, in the county, but that's the data that we need to, you know, in my view, come up with in terms of an average gross household income to establish what is really affordable in Prince Edward County. And then we can turn uh, to a more pristine set of numbers that are current and workable for us in terms of affording, uh, uh, assessing affordability. So um, I think there's certainly work that the corporation has done. I think this motion indicates that there's between Shire Hall and the corporation, there's room for kind of a joint venture on some salient data to be added to that mix. And I can only once again say that Councillor St. Jean's done a great job. Thanks. Councillor Harper. Um, I didn't actually have my hand up. Maybe it was oh, an involuntary, <laughs> not, not me. Okay. Anyone else? No? Okay. Uh, I'll just say that, um, you know, this, this whole concept of uh, affordable housing, we have been kicking it around now for a couple of uh, terms of council. And I think that it's something that, uh, whether it's by the numbers, I mean, 
I think we have a uh, a moral obligation to try and make sure we this this uh, county is built on generational families, and I don't want to see that end with with our generation that the generations to follow that the children of our children will not be will not be able to live in Prince Edward County. Okay, on that cheery note, uh, can I have a, uh, so the motion was on the floor, all in favor, it carries, and then uh, we'll move to item seven, which is the adjournment. Mover. Councillor Prinson, Mayor Ferguson. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's a Prinson Ferguson motion that this meeting now adjourn at 3 p.m. All in favor. Thanks everyone. I think we have some good discussion.